Do we, do we need live. to do any muting? And we're live. Great. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, on behalf of the Munich Security Conference, welcome to our nightcap um, on Germany's national security architecture. This is part of an event, an annual event called Deutsches Forum Sicherheitspolitik, which is organized by the Federal Academy of Security Policy. Last year, we looked at the issue of um, a national security strategy, which Germany then did not have. Um, in the meantime, our new government coalition has decided that we should have one. And um, good colleagues around Berlin are writing up this, this paper, which hopefully will be out um, at the end of this year or early next year. Um, so what we wanted to do this time around is to look forward and consider how such a national security strategy, which no doubt will be an excellent paper, can be implemented and whether our national security architecture is up to task. We have two distinguished colleagues to, to help us um, with this, two friends of the MSC, Lord Peter Ricketts, who had a very distinguished career in the UK Foreign Service, um, including as the first UK National Security Advisor when the National Security Council was created in 2010. Um, and Julia Friedlander of the Atlantic Council, um, soon to be CEO of Atlantic Brook in Berlin, um, who has served around the US government, I think that's a fair statement, but significantly um, at, um, at the National Security Council as Director for European Affairs, to use the short version of her title, um, and um, several times around at the US Treasury. So thanks very much for being with us this evening. It's, it's great to have you. Also online is um, my colleague Gerhard Konrad, the intelligence advisor to the Munich Security Conference. We have such a thing, and, and that's, that's very good. He had a distinguished career at BND um, and also served as the director of the EU INTSEN, um, uh, quite an important body, um, and, and he will come in later in the discussion. We're talking on WebEx, obviously, um, the four of us, but our audience is following via YouTube, and um, our audience can put questions into the YouTube chat, which I encourage you to do as soon as you have a good idea or a good question that you'd like to share. Please keep in mind that this is on the record and that we are, in fact, being recorded as we speak. Let me start by giving a brief explanation of why we have chosen to discuss this particular topic um, of German national security architecture this evening. In October 2020, one year ahead of the German national elections, we put out this publication um, called Zeitenwende um, on German foreign policy. And Zeitenwende translates as turn of an era or paradigm shift or something along those lines. In that report, um, among other things, we made the case for one, a national security strategy, um, and secondly, for better coordination mechanisms for national security in the German government. Um, the government, uh, the new government coalition rather, um, as mentioned, did in fact agree that we should have a national security strategy, um, but so far there has been no decision taken on um, adjusting our mechanisms for national security coordination. Um, whether that is creating a new National Security Council um, or whether it is making better use of the Federal Security Council, which is already in existence. It's worth noting that two out of three coalition partners, specifically the Greens and the Liberals, called for new mechanisms in their election platforms in 2021. And the Social Democratic Party, while not calling for specifically for such mechanisms, did call for, quote, overcoming silo thinking between ministries and government agencies. And what is remarkable, I think, is that 1998, so for the past 24 years, we've had this discussion going on about whether or not we need to improve in this regard. Back then, in 1998, it was the um, Social Democratic Green Coalition Agreement signed by Gerhard Schröder and Joschka Fischer um, calling for such things to be done, and specifically for the Federal Security Council to be restored to its original coordinating role. This is after 16 years of Helmut Kohl, 
working without making use of the Federal Security Council. And the Green Social Democratic Coalition coming into office said, um, we should now um, we should now make use of it and and um, and revive it in a sense. In the 2016 White Book, which which both of you may have come across, um, Julia and Peter, um, the federal government announced that it would be using the Federal Security Council in a more systematic way. But at the end of the day, uh, frankly, nothing happened. Now I think the issue will be on the table again in the context of the national security strategy, because the obvious question will be, once we have this undoubtedly excellent paper, how will we implement it? Will we be able to implement it across ministries and government agencies? And of course, the issue will be discussed against the backdrop of recent experience, as you would imagine. And let me just mention four experiences or issue areas. Number one, the 2021 Afghanistan evacuation. Um, secondly, Russia's recent or most recent invasion, I should say, of Ukraine beginning in February 2022. Um, thirdly, the issue of Nord Stream 2 and um, what I think um, can be called the train wreck of German energy policy that we have just uh, lived through. And finally, the issue of climate and security and how to bring those things together. Those are some of the things I believe people will be thinking about and reflecting on as, as they consider whether we need to make a change. So this is the context. My apologies for the very long introduction. What I would like to do now is for Peter to speak for about five minutes about the UK system that was created about 10 years ago. He was there. He was the first... UK National Security Advisor, his personal experience, and, and to what extent that might inform our thinking here in Berlin. And then I'd ask uh, Julia afterwards to tell us about the um, American NSC, which is obviously very different, given that this is a presidential system. Um, but nonetheless, I think there's, there's lessons to be learned. And later, I would, I would ask Gerhard Konrad uh, to come into the conversation and tell us about the intelligence angle of some of these issues and, and how that fits into the German setup. And afterwards, of course, we'll go to the questions from our viewers on YouTube. Um, so once again, um, please write your questions as soon as any come to mind into the chat. Um, and then I'll, I'll um, read out those questions as many as I can. And with that, Peter, over to you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed, Boris. And although it's perhaps a bit early in London to be having a nightcap, perhaps even earlier for Julia in Washington, it's a great pleasure to be with you. Um, and congratulations to MSC, not least for producing your Seitenwender uh, book um, last year. I mean, if it wasn't quite a Seitenwender then, it certainly is now. So very timely. And I'm very happy to talk briefly about our experience in the UK. Uh, in 2010, David Cameron was elected prime minister with a manifesto commitment that if he was elected, he was going to set up a National Security Council. And the backdrop was essentially a lot of public unease about the alleged informality of the Tony Blair decision making uh, famously over the Iraq war. And the Conservatives wanted essentially to copy on a much smaller scale uh, the Washington uh, example of an NSC, which was the first to be created and uh, in, in many ways the, the model for the rest of us. And I think if we'd asked ministers then what exactly they wanted out of an NSC, they'd have said something like three things. First of all, better coordination across government of this expanding universe of national security uh, with more issues concerning more departments and the need for rigorous decision making uh, against the backdrop of that Blair history. And I mean, in addition to the four burning topics you just uh, referenced, Boris, you could add a fifth. We now know that public health is also uh, potentially a national security issue after the COVID pandemic. So first, better coordination. Secondly, um, better decision making through more challenge. Um, this was a very strong theme with David Cameron. He wanted a forum where all the senior ministers from the national security departments, foreign affairs, defense, interior, etc., plus some non-departmental ministers to inject some blue skies thinking could meet with the senior advisors across government to hear their advice, to probe it, to challenge it, to debate it, um, and then to make decisions and set priorities. 
And then the third, um, I think priority they would have set was um, better strategic planning, um, not just an instrument for managing day-to-day -day issues and giving political direction in a crisis, but also to do the longer term strategic thinking and horizon scanning to try to spot um, the next issue, the next threat, and the one behind that as well. <clears throat> so if that was the uh, the standard they were aiming for, how how what has our experience been? As a coordination mechanism, I think certainly in the early years when I was involved, it did produce a, a good forum where ministers across government became familiar with each other's issues um, and had a place where they could take coherent decisions and set priorities among competing objectives. It also, funnily enough, turned out to be uh, a useful place for coalition management because unexpectedly we had a coalition in 2010 and some of the issues that could have been very difficult between the two partners, like the balance between um, security and privacy in, in counterterrorism legislation, the NSC became a forum where we could uh, debate those things and resolve them. I think it's probably true to say that in the early days, the major departments of state, like the Foreign Office and the Defense Ministry, were nervous about the arrival of a new kid on the block, uh, close to the prime minister, that it could become a barrier between senior ministers and the prime minister. But experience, I think, has shown that a good minister with good ideas can use the National Security Council structure as an amplifier, as a way of getting buy-in across government to pursue policies. We also were careful to keep the structure, the secretariat of the NSC small, so it was not a competing bureaucracy with the main departments of state. And also the prime minister decided that he would appoint a civil servant as national security advisor, <clears throat> and I, as you say, was the first one, not a politician who might become um, competitive with other senior ministers and a barrier. And I think in our system, uh, that worked well. It's obviously a rather different setup in the US. Julia will talk about it. <clears throat> but it did also give us a single person in our government who could talk to the US National Security Advisor, which is a, a, a useful thing, I think. So by and large, is a coordination mechanism useful? As a mechanism for testing and contesting official advice, <clears throat> I mean, that depends crucially on the Prime Minister of the day. We found that David Cameron was very good at that and used the National Security Council very actively for that. Theresa May, a bit less so, more concerned with internal security issues. And I gather Boris Johnson is not using the NSC so much and prefers other mechanisms. So it does depend on the prime minister, the chancellor in Germany of the day, using a mechanism and using it to actually make decisions so that senior ministers know it's a forum that counts. One other benefit in terms of testing uh, and uh, challenging is the presence at the National Security Council of the intelligence agency heads. We've never before in the UK <clears throat> had um, collective access for the intelligence community to ministers. We've had individual intelligence agencies reporting to individual ministers, but this gave senior ministers a chance to meet, see, discuss uh, with intelligence heads <clears throat> the I mean, for example, the reliability of a particular line of reporting or why they made a particular analysis and how was their level of confidence in it. <clears throat> it if you like, it was an intelligent client function for the intelligence community with the policy uh, world that they hadn't had before. And as long as you avoid crossing the line into the uh, area where intelligence heads are giving policy advice, as long as you keep them in the uh, reporting and the analysis area, then that, I think, has been a benefit as well. On um, uh, strategic thinking, uh, there, I think, honestly, uh, we haven't succeeded. Um, we tried to maintain a balance in the early years between using the NSC for operational issues uh, and for more longer term thematic uh, horizon scanning kind of thinking. And honestly, ministers so love to get their hands on the immediate issue, uh, the uh, immediate crisis, uh, that they really weren't prepared to give a lot of time or attention to the longer term um, uh, foresight as to what might be coming, but might, of course, not happen. The urgent drives out the important. I think it's a much wider issue, actually, for our democracies, that it is really hard to get um, senior ministerial attention away from the tyranny of the um, 
breaking news world in which they live. And uh, I can't say that the British National Security Council has really made much progress on that. But overall, I mean, I think it has been useful. Obviously, every government has to adopt this model to their own um, constitutional arrangements, administrative culture. But in this world of multiplying national security threats, I think some sort of coordination mechanism is important um, and also a chance to take a wider view while also trying to cope with the disruptive threats that uh, the world keeps throwing at us all. So there's an opener, Boris, and of course, very happy to take up any issue from that. Lovely. Thank you very much, Peter. Maybe maybe I can follow up um, with, with one question. Um, I, you've already touched on it, sort of how did, how did the Foreign Office, how did the MOD react to the creation of this new structure that, that could be seen as competition? And I think this is a sentiment that is felt very strongly in Berlin, mm -hmm. uh, where ministers have a kind of constitutionally guaranteed autonomy in running their ministries. And there's a sense that um, a, a stronger structure located at the chancellor's office, presumably, in terms of power and influence and visibility would undercut the traditional ministries. And it's seen as, is, I think it's, it's actually seen as a zero sum game. Um, um, yeah. Whatever, whatever you know, we give, we put into additional coordination um, represents a loss for the individual ministries. And, and I'd just like you to comment on that aspect um, in addition to what you've already said. Yes, and, and there, was a, there was a degree of nervousness, even perhaps resentment, particularly in the Foreign Office, that there was this new structure in Whitehall that might usurp some of their functions. Of course, we don't have exactly the same constitutional setup, Boris. Other ministers are all dependent on the prime minister, and the prime minister can interfere you know, at will if he, if he decides or she decides to do so in the work of individual ministries. <clears throat> there is collective cabinet responsibility. And in a way, the NSC um, exemplified that. It was a collective um, body for taking decisions across government. And as I say, I think it's important uh, in a certainly in a structure like ours, not to make the national security secretariat too large, <clears throat> not large enough to be able to initiate policy uh, of their own and become a competing bureaucracy with others, and not to create a national security council, sorry, a national security advisor figure, who is political, who is high profile, who does media interviews, and who competes for political space with other senior ministers. I was very careful never to get between the prime minister and his senior ministers, but always to facilitate discussion among them. And over time, I think those concerns lessened, particularly because the ministry saw that, as I say, if they came forward with a good, attractive policy proposal, they could get the prime minister's attention, they could get buy-in from the other major departments, because almost no policy these days can be implemented only by the foreign ministry. It always needs buy-in from other departments, usually resources as well. And the NSC was a forum in which to do that. And I think, therefore, over time, the resistance to it has lessened as people found that it could be a way of amplifying and expediting your own idea and getting it whole of government backing. Thank you, Peter. Very helpful. Very interesting. Julia, you know the German system very well. Um, so. Um, what what can you you know what, what insights do you think would be useful coming out of the U.S. system for for the debate that I think we need to have over here? Sure, thank you, Boris. And again, it's a pleasure to do this. So thank you so much for the invitation. Um, you know, I think that it's a from from the U.S. perspective, uh, the U.S. National Security Council is a post-war institution. Right, it sits atop, um, you know, the 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 situation that the United States found itself in in the post-war period, with uh, you know the emergence of certain three-letter agency and um, a huge military-industrial complex that it had never had, and a role in the world it had never had. And I think that from that um, from that principle in the you know in the 40s and 50s, this the National Security Council has grown. Right, first from being an immediate coordinating body, uh, basically the coordinating power of the White House to bring key ministers together, um, to then addition adding staff, 
right? Um, and creating um, this centralized body within, again, our presidential system um, that allowed us to coordinate the um, in, in ever-growing U.S. government and an ever-growing concept of what national security actually means, right? Um, I was part of the national security strategy drafting um, under the last administration under General McMaster. Um, and I think what was useful about that process was not really the paper that we produced, because in the end, these papers are sausage, it's part of a sausage making process. Everybody adds their bells and whistles or their ornaments on the Christmas tree. Someone strips them out, someone makes them get, get puts them back in. Um, and they, but they, you know, they produce guidelines for us to follow. But for me, what the most instructive process, uh, sort of element of that was haggling with my colleagues over what we're going to put in there, right? What does it actually mean to, to, to prioritize certain, uh, certain coordinating bodies, certain organizations, certain bilateral or multilateral relationships? Um, how does that reflect the, um, the, the preferences of our political masters, right? But then also the, the structures and the realities of the way the US government functions. And so I, again, like, I didn't love the paper. I think few people didn't like the paper. I mean, it was also the Trump administration's paper, so people had a lot of problems with it. Um, but again, the the the, the um, it was sort of the process of getting there that I found was most instructive, um, and that I think is you know from my work with uh, with German counterparts, seeing that that forced collaboration between agencies. And we can talk about some of the different challenges, Boris, you mentioned them at the beginning, that require not just the the sort of traditional characters around the table that you think make national security decisions, like from the Treasury Department, okay? I mean, the Secretary of the Treasury only recently was formally part of the national security, you know, immediate national security council, now in every, essentially every meeting, every what would be a cabinet meeting with the president. Um, and so, that, that the concept in America has also shifted. Um, I would not say that, I mean, again, <laughs> we have our fights with as a presidential system are more with Congress than they are with coalition partners. Obviously, we don't have coalition partners. We do have personalities, though. We do have we do have fiefdoms, right? I mean, the, in a way, the State Department is huge, right? The Defense Department is huge. These are these are ginormous buildings that you get lost in, right? And so um, you know, the, the fact that the NSC in many ways in the US sometimes serves as a, a coordinating committee, not only between ministries, but within ministries. You'll get a call and say, so and so in that office, in that office, and you'll have to meet out, you know, sort of meet out differences between the two of them. So again, the larger your government, um, and the German government is not small, um, you know, the more that um, you do need some sort of centrifugal force to keep the whole thing together. Um, I, you know, I would not say that um, that the U.S. National Security Council in its current form ha is, is always a paradigm of efficiency. Uh, certainly not. You know, I mean, I think that the idea there, what I like about it the most when it functions, is that it's not only a coordinating and coordinating body for the ministers, right, because they have cabinet meetings, right, you, you know, and, um, and, and Germany does have cabinet meetings. Um, and so it's the coordinating on the lower levels, right, and the levels where, you know, I as a, you know, a, as a, a staffer, and on the national security staff, my role was to advise the national security advisor, deputy national security advisor, and then through them, the president. But then really what my job was, was to call interagency meetings of my colleagues to say, you know, I, sometimes it was my boss who told me, you know, um, or, you know, it was, you know, together with, you know, by my, my, you know, with, with dearly with Fiona Hill. Okay. These people have to be pulled in. We need to have a meeting on X. Sometimes it was the national security advisor who said, you need to have a meeting on X. A lot of the times it was actually just me saying, you know what, I think there's a problem here. I see so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so are in different places. And the ability for junior or relatively junior mid-level staff to be able to pull colleagues in and say, we're going to try to handle this issue at the lowest level possible and feed that information up. Ideally, a decision should be made at the lowest possible level, right? That the, that the president and the cabinet um, only reach a decision point um, when they, when the, you know, and receive information um, or are brought together when there is a decision point to be made to say we have worked this up and the assistant secretaries and the undersecretaries and the deputies, we have all sort of created a, created a decision point around a specific topic. 
It doesn't always work that way. <laughs> a lot of times it's very top down. Um, and the um, and decision making because just gets pushed further and further up the level because no no one takes in, takes responsibility at the mid level. Um, or we have to refer this up, you know. Um, and the other thing is about the size of the staff itself. I mean, I think what you said about keeping it slim, you know, this is forever and a day, the aspirations of various administrations, usually it's a Republican administration that says we want to trim it down and make it bring it back to the quote unquote Brett Scowcroft model, right? Um, you know, also Atlanta Council hero, of course. Um, you know, uh, it's, but in reality, and even, you know, and then of course in Democratic administrations, it balloons out again. I would say that I worked with enough with about the same amount of colleagues at the at the Trump NSC as my as my predecessors did on the Obama NSC. There are always a lot of people there. And I would say that it is for the for Germans thinking about this, it is a cautionary tale in power sucking in the creation of a shadow, a shadow, a shadow government, right? Old, almost within itself that um, essentially uses the, um, the interagency as implementers, right? And not as the decision makers themselves. And so I do see that, I do see that happening. I do see that happening now. Um, not that I have any lack of faith in those in the White House at the moment, but I do think that when you get to a point where and I, you know, I think that every system must have this in some way, but, you know, the top members are making important decisions via text message, right? Some version of text message, then you have problem. Um, and everybody else is just sort of floating around in their fiefdoms. I thought that it was important for me um, as a treasury economist, I'm also an intelligence analyst by training, but to come to the NSC to actually understand how my own government functioned. Um, to, and, you know, if you talk about the Russia crisis, okay, what, what we have collectively done in the, in the financial, economic, and regulatory sphere is something that you cannot do if you're sitting in, in the room, in one room in the Pentagon, in one room in the agency, in one room at the State Department. Um, and it also means you have to understand, this is how Commerce Department authorities work, therefore export controls. These are how trade restrictions work, therefore the U.S. Trade Representative. These are sanctions. Treasury, right? And so there's um, there's a certain aspect there that if you're looking at these modern challenges that we have, again, going back to you know, what you mentioned, Russia, Afghanistan, climate, um, you know, you can be blindsided by what by the input of your colleagues that you didn't know was there, right? And so you know, my you know, I mean, I'm, I don't presume to say Germany do this. You know, I would say you need a slightly larger chancellery staff. My counterparts there are overworked. Um, uh, under-resourced with a lot on their shoulders and there needs to be a coordinating function at the junior and mid-level to allow, and, and again, bringing in any agency that might have some equity in an issue. It doesn't, you know, I mean, it could be the, you know, the Ministry of Agriculture, right? It doesn't, you know, you know, talking about the food crisis, right? I mean, again, all of these things are, um, are, are things that uh, are better solved through a slightly larger circle. Thanks, so Julia. Thank you very much. Um, in in sort of just by way of terminology, the NSC, strictly speaking, mm -hmm. is the 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 gathering of the president and cabinet mm -hmm. secretaries. Um, but but sort of in the NSC is regular referred to when we talk about the NSC. Oftentimes we mean the the staff of the NSC, right? Correct. Okay. And, and the high point in terms of the size of the NSC was in the Obama administration? Uh, I think it probably is the current administration okay. in terms of sheer numbers, yeah. And you have, I think in the Obama administration, was it 400 or something like that? I don't know the, I mean, I think that it, it depends upon how you count it. Um, yeah. But yes, it was something, the individual sitting within the Eisenhower building was, uh, was something around that number, yes. Yeah. Um, but then again, it's, it's not only, you get, and again, that it's, these are direct, we call them directorates, different offices, they're functional as well as regional. So you have a whole um, resilience or, you know, the, the economists and, um, and democracy promotion. I mean, all of these are stacks in and of themselves um, within the, the greater national security council staff. So it's not only like being the director of European affairs, Europe office, Asia office. 
And and just to follow up on one other thing you said, Julia, um, the size of the staff in the transfers office historically and currently quite small, really. Um, and one thing that I remember from my time working on Middle East issues here in Berlin as Middle East North Africa director and prior to that as a head of division was that I would travel to Washington quite regularly and I would see colleagues at the NSC, but, but colleagues at the chancellor's office hardly ever got that chance. Um, and if they got it, it was traveling with the chancellor, which, which happened very rarely. And typically it was very few people from the chancellor's staff who could accompany. So can you, can, sort of, can you tell me a little bit about your interaction with colleagues in the chancellor's office and also the, you know, how the interaction worked or, or you know, numbers I think do matter? I mean, I think that, well, I mean, I mean, again, I can only speak for the for the experience that I had um, as uh, someone who felt that given the administration that I worked in, the best thing you could do when you weren't able to execute on a concrete policy was to at least explain what was happening. And so I spent personally spent a lot of time building bridges to European counterparts, um, not only Germany, to, you know, to all of them. Um, uh, but no, it was a, it was daily uh, daily cooperation, daily emails, often daily calls. Um, but again, a lot of the issues that we dealt with pertain to Germany rather intimately. Um, they sometimes came by themselves, <laughs> not only accompanying their boss, but in, but, but in a limited fashion. Um, but but the bandwidth right was was very slim, right? I mean, I could always say, oh, you want to talk more about the specific issue? I have three colleagues who'll give you more information. Um, Peter, you um, you mentioned one point that I, I found interesting, which was that um, by creating a national security council and a national security advisor on the UK side, you had one person who was the obvious counterpart to the US national security advisor. Before you, you brought, you, you created the system, was there a kind of, was there less clarity on who the point person in London was? Yes, and it varied with the personalities around the Prime Minister of the time. Um, there were times when the Prime Minister had a very strong um, official working near him. I'm thinking of Charles Powell uh, with Margaret Thatcher, who was then the natural counterpart of the US National Security Advisor. At other times, that wasn't so clear. And therefore, it wasn't absolutely clear who the US NSA called at three in the morning, you know, when the crisis was erupting. And having a National Security Council with somebody sitting in the secretariat function at the top means that there is a single point of contact, whether it's a foreign affairs issue, whether it's something to do with defense or intelligence or pursuing Osama bin Laden, whatever it may be, there is an individual with a similar coverage of issues in London as there is in Washington, of course, with far fewer staff. But I think it is quite an important point. I mean, when I served in Paris, there are basically two people who do the job of the National Security Council, uh, National Security Advisor, um, the head of the uh, president's military staff and his diplomatic advisor. And so the US uh, National Security Advisor probably have to call both, really. In Germany, it's probably the chancellor's diplomatic advisor, but he or she doesn't have a full coverage of all the issues that the US NSA covers. So there is a point, I think, about uh, docking effectively with the uh, US national security structure. Excellent. Thanks, Peter. So maybe we can bring in Gerhard. Let's see, where are you, Gerhard? I think Julius will bring you in, I hope. Can you hear us? There he is. I can see your name, Gerhard. That's, that's the first step. Can you hear us? Not yet. Okay, we'll give you. We'll give now you. Now maybe. Now maybe you can. Now hear me. absolutely. Yes. At least you can hear me, and of course, it's a question of status that you possibly can't see me, <laughs> which is odd. 
If you if you'd rather not be seen, Gerhard, that's fine. That's okay. You're okay. the intelligence advisor after all, so that's which that's is okay. which is really funny. I yeah. don't know whether I committed a mistake, but anyway, my my camera is not working, although it should. Uh, and uh, so, uh, well, thank you very much for having me after all. And uh, uh, just for my my Anglo American audience, such me, I'm not that unknown, and you can even see my picture, my photo, if you consult the web page of KCL. So just around the corner, um, <laughs> since I'm a visiting professor at KCL, uh, uh, among other, uh, let's say, waste mm -hmm. of time, and as, uh, as, uh, as uh, Boris already said, intelligence advisor to the MSC, and uh, here in Germany, I'm working a little bit on the forum intelligence services in Germany, just trying to make uh, the work of intelligence services better understood in Germany, which, as you know, is kind of a challenge, just to introduce uh, I mean, uh, with these few words. But now I'm all yours. So you have, there's two German terms, um, you know, long German words. One is Lagefeststellung, <laughs> and the other one is Lagebeurteilung. Yeah. Um, and and um, uh, Peter has already spoken to the intelligence aspects um, and how he felt the UK system that was introduced in 2010 was um, um, was uh, was useful in bringing together the intelligence community with. Uh, cabinet level um, officials. Tell us a little bit about how you see the German system as it exists today and whether there are things that you would like to see changed um, and, and uh, modernized or reformed. Yeah, well, we for, for the time being, we see that we have in Germany the Bundesnachrichtendienst, the Federal uh, Foreign Intelligence Service, uh, which is a civilian and a military uh, intelligence service at the same time, uh, side by side with the uh, BFV, so the Internal uh, Security Service, uh, the Office for the Protection of the Constitution, a British, uh, as you know, uh, creation after the Second World War, uh, in addition to a military uh, security service, which is only, let's say, the military sister service of the civil uh, uh, internal service. Uh, and what uh, we do not know, uh, what we do not have, is a military intelligence service comparable to DI, uh, for example, in, in uh, the British system, or the DIA in the American system, of course. Uh, these services provide, and let's focus first a little bit on the, on the BND. The BND is uh, subordinated as one of the very rare federal uh, government uh, organizations to the federal chancery. So the chief of the chancery is the responsible uh, minister uh, for uh, first supervising, overseeing uh, the BND and coordinating the federal intelligence and security services, which, as we just learned, are not that many. Uh, Side by side, the BFV is, uh, let's say, subject to the Ministry of Interior, a little bit uh, uh, comparable to MI5 uh, with the uh, Home Office. Uh, and of course, all military guys are, uh, let's say, part of the, um, uh, let's say, the MOD. Uh, but you see, uh, the BND is the only one which has, in principle, a direct link to the Federal Chancellor. The other ones uh, come to the Federal Chancellor if they come they don't, uh, via the ministries, the respective minister, the Minister of Defense and the Minister of Interior, uh, just popping in into the cabinet. There is a kind of uh, not coordinating meeting because the, the results of these meetings are just uh, the comment nice uh, that we have spoken about it, uh, where uh, Tuesdays, uh, near, nearly at the same date as the NSC in, in the UK, uh, Tuesdays, uh, the heads of the services and other heads of police, for example, uh, services, and the secretaries of state of the ministries, the federal ministries, meet uh, in the uh, chancery, uh, presided, the meeting is presided normally by the chief of the chancery, uh, uh, and it's called in our language ND Lager, that means uh, the in situational awareness meeting of uh, by the intelligence services which is not completely true. It's more a kind of security issues related meetings uh, where, of course, the president of the BND, of the BFO, and uh, let's say the, the head of the military uh, security service organization, as well as the head of the federal police, uh, 
uh, and other uh, security agencies uh, are just reporting what's on, what's the situation, short situational awareness, uh, but not comprehensive one, and it's just an exchange of views. And the state secretaries of the ministry sometimes are asking questions, or sometimes are just sitting around and sleeping a little bit, and after that, the, the, the two hours uh, meeting, roughly two hours meeting, you know, there are no decisions, there are no protocols, uh, which is very good if you enter then the investigatory uh, uh, meetings uh, of parliament. Yeah, there is nothing. It's just, you know, an inconclusive meeting. Possibly that the uh, head of the chancellor said, oh, well, maybe the service, one of the services could look a little bit more closer uh, into this or that question, which had been discussed, but uh, had not been uh, well understood by, or by the whole audience yeah? and by the service itself as well. Yeah? So that's the name of the game. Uh, the Chancellor himself, herself in former times, uh, uh, is normally not involved, nor are the ministers as such. Uh, there is now, in very recent days, uh, we have a slightly different uh, setup, as I gather. I'm not a part of that uh, structure, as you know, anymore. I'm a poor pensioner since 2019. Um, but uh, uh, so that the president of the BND, in view of the uh, current situation, especially concerning Ukraine, uh, has a direct access to the chancellor himself and to cabinet itself. He is reporting, I don't know how often, but a kind of regularly reporting to the minister, to the whole cabinet, and very often uh, to the chancellor himself or the head of the chancellery at least. That's roughly the setup, but this is then the head of the Foreign Intelligence Service, full stop. It's, uh, and there is no structure yet, for example, to combine uh, now inputs from the different services in a regular way. Uh, that's, that's the name of the game. It has always been that situation. Uh, and uh, if you are unlucky and you have a chancellor or a chancellery which is not particularly interested uh, in the inputs of the services, so you end up, especially the BND, although the chancellery is, uh, uh, let's say, oversight institute at the guiding uh, instance, so you end up uh, in uh, Directorate 7, former times Directorate 6, which is the working muscle of the uh, head of the chancellery in coordinating and overseeing the BND. And uh, your papers are lost and your input is lost as well and uh, flatly neglected or ignored. This is a, that's so a stovepipe is uh, very often, uh, let's say, the name of the game. That was a situation. Uh, funnily speaking, uh, uh, Boris mentioned it already, uh, between 1998 and uh, 2005, when we had the SPD Green Party, the first coalition of that kind, uh, there had been a very active uh, uh, let's say participation in BND situational reporting due to the fact that Mr. Steinmeier at that time was uh, head of the chancellery. Uh, Mr. Uh, Urlau was a later president of the BND, was the chief or uh, the head of the director at six, and Mr. Hanning was the president. The three of them uh, made, uh, let's say, they, they really worked hand in glove uh, in providing the chancellor and the minister of foreign affairs, Schroeder and Fischer, with an the best we could provide at that time, yeah, an updated intelligence-based situational awareness. That's where we uh, have been. Uh, meanwhile, the, the former previous 16 years were, let's say, a little bit different. Let's put it this way. So that's the situation we have. I personally uh, was head uh, for a while, a short while, two and a half years, was a chief of the presidential uh, staff uh, in uh, the BND between uh, 2009 and late 2011, no, late 2012, sorry, 2012, uh, just prior to my uh, 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 secondment uh, to the German embassy to London, and then being the, the representative BND with the British services and with Whitehall, with 70 Whitehall as well. Uh, so I uh, got, let's say, the uh, impression that uh, you uh, had already done a very, very uh, precious job, not only in creating the NSC, but I should add to that uh, in uh, creating or allowing the GIO or the GIC, as you call it, the Joint Intelligence Organization, together with the assessment staff of Cabinet Office. 
uh, uh, creating that structure which provides the NSC with what we call situational awareness. Uh, in a way, a comprehensive, not only based on MI6, MI5, GCHQ inputs, but DI inputs, and you know it better than me, yeah? and FCO inputs and other uh, uh, ministries inputs, uh, to comprehensive and concise situational awareness papers, I call it, uh, which then uh, were introduced as a working paper, situational working paper, to NSC, presented by uh, the uh, chief uh, GAO, I think, sometimes to the chagrin of the heads of services, but uh, all of them were present and then discuss discussion on the situation, how to understand it and how to make the best out of it uh, in terms of understanding, first of all, and analysis uh, was, as I was told, I never participated, of course, in the name of the game, but I participated in one element that I was able due the, during the first Ukraine crisis in 2014 to, for example, brief personally on a daily basis the assessment staff of cabinet office uh, and introduce uh, findings or assessments of my mother service at home uh, to, uh, let's say, the colleagues over there who took that input among very, very many others uh, uh, as an element uh, of situational awareness. Uh, so, uh, so even, let's say, sometimes reaching out not only within the national governmental structures or intelligence services, but I say to trusted allies, uh, was considered at that time as a way of doing it. Uh, and uh, frankly speaking, and I witnessed that's the last uh, uh, sentence. Uh, just uh, when I then went from London to Brussels as Director Inten the Intelligence uh, and Assessment and Situation Center. So by chance it was created, as you certainly know, by a Brit <laughs> for, for Solana. <laughs> so again, I met a very, so I felt nearly at home when I looked at the structures and dealings uh, of the Intelligence Assessment and Situation Center in Brussels, because some elements of uh, the NSC and especially the GIO JIC uh, were replicated, of course, adapted to the multilateral situation you have when you have 20, at that time, 28 member states uh, of the European Union. And that's a 28 by two or three, even if you add all the services, because it was internal, external services for INSEN and UMS INT, let's say, together with the, with the military services. So we were able, in Brussels, yeah, to fuse yeah, the finished intelligence inputs by, by, of in theory, 55 to 60 European uh, intelligence and security services. Uh, so this, in terms of quality and comprehensiveness, it's nearly a kind of unique structure, of course, not in terms of quality in depth intelligence. Yeah. So that's, Thank that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Maybe, Peter, um, the Joint Intelligence Organization uh, which I I don't know whether it was created at the same time as the National Security Council, but that's sort of how I imagine it, that it is the intelligence piece that plugs into the NSC. Could you, do you want to um, add to what Gerhard had just said? Yeah, in fact, the Joint Intelligence Committee was created in 1936 um, and was the premier place where intelligence assessments were produced throughout the Second World War and the Cold War and up to the current day. Um, as Gerhard said, our uh, tradition in the UK is that intelligence heads don't um, talk directly to ministers collectively. Um, MI6 reports to the Foreign Office, MI5 to the Home Office, and GCHQ also to the Foreign Office. But uh, the JIC produced uh, weekly papers for ministers. Um, uh, they went into the red box at the weekend. The Prime Minister, if you were lucky, they came out with a red tick on them saying that the Prime Minister had read them, often very, no, no further reaction to them. And the JIC started again to um, suck its pencils and think what might be interesting to ministers the following week. What the NSC has revolutionized is that the JIC assessments are presented collectively to ministers. People are there to see uh, the reaction. Ministers can say, are you sure about that report? Is it reliable? Uh, how trustworthy is the source? Um, 
I imagine before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the intelligence was tested pretty thoroughly before the government then went out and put it out publicly. So it gives a docking point and it gives um, a relationship between the intelligence community and ministers where each side can see whether the other is producing what is necessary, um, whether it's uh, on target, whether it's relevant or whether um, other things are needed. And that has been a bit, a bit of a revolution because otherwise the NSC, um, uh, sorry, the JIC, the intelligence assessment function stood to one side of the political process and was pretty much fenced off from it apart from written communications. And therefore, I think in the British system, this works well. We are careful to make sure that intelligence agencies are not giving advice on policy, but it does mean they can see how political leaders are reacting to their material, uh, what is strong about it, what needs further work. And therefore, I think that's a gain. Thank you, Peter. One question to you, Gerhard. Um, and this may or may not be relevant to our conversation, but back in the summer of 21, we had these floods um, in, in the Western areas of Germany. And um, obviously this was an issue that was handled at the level of the states, the lender. Um, there was information available in the system, um, but it was not acted on. And at the end of the day, we had 180 people um, killed in those floods. Um, is there anything we can learn from, from that experience that is, is relevant to the um, conversation that, that we're having at the national level and on national security issues? Definitely, we, we can. Of course, there is not intelligence uh, at stake in the narrow sense, in the sense of secret intelligence uh, in, in such uh, national disaster situations, but information and, of course, the need of assessed information. Uh, so situational awareness uh, as such is much larger than uh, secret uh, intelligence. Um, and uh, what we should learn from this uh, sad events is that we need to have a structured flow of assessed information to on the regional level and where necessary uh, on the national level in order to be, first of all, aware and intervene if you decide that you have to intervene. As soon as a uh, catastrophe uh, crosses the local or the regional borders, then, of course, at least coordination or even active uh, intervention uh, may be needed not only by the Ministry of Interior, traditionally in Germany, or that, uh, let's say, resilience, creating resilience in terms of national emergencies, uh, natural disasters or others, is the ultimate uh, responsibility of the Ministry of Interior, the Home Office, and the, on the lender level, as you know, the as well independent, uh, sovereign uh, ministries of interior of the 16 lender. Uh, and below them, then in the communal context, uh, and the, uh, the the cities and the, the, the are as well, at least semi-independent. That means, uh, having said that, uh, these independent authorities on the local, uh, regional, and then of course on the national level should really follow similar stringent uh, procedures of relaying information, having unified. Uh, as well, um, uh, procedures in understanding situational awareness and relaying it then to the so-called upper levels with the aim of keeping them informed and enabling them uh, based on that situational uh, awareness to react where necessary. This is something uh, which has not been started. Yeah, that's it's a half a start uh, structure just ending up in the Ministry of Interior if you are lucky. Very often it just ends in the lender and the federation, yeah, the Bund. Yeah? So the, even the Ministry of Interior is not aware uh, and not, uh, has no timely awareness of this. I was also thinking in terms of simply that this is an example of how there's critical information available in a system um, yep. with an, an advance warning. And yet um, there's a failure to act. Now, obviously not a national security issue in, in, the, in the narrower sense, but I thought it was remarkable. And, and obviously the, the, there's parliamentary commissions looking into what was done and um, at what point uh, there was a failure of communication or decision-making that, that um, ended up in this, 
in this very, very sad situation. I want to take a few questions from the audience. Um, I have one for, for Julian. Oh, I'm here. I, ah, there you are. Now yes. I'm here. <laughs> I managed. Now I disappear from the yeah, obscure. Yeah, OK. Yes. Okay. Welcome, Gerhard. So, Julia, should the discussion on the need for a national security architecture not be preceded by a discussion on our interests and the aims we want to achieve? Do you want to speak to that? Sure. I mean, I think that's a little bit what I was getting at with this idea of the, of the drafting of a national security strategy. I think that Germany has often struggled with the concept of what national security means. Um, but, and I think the, sometimes, I mean, sometimes the U.S. has, but I think we have this growing concept of calling everything national security, which is also a risk. But this idea of shared national interest, right, um, that um, that I think is not has, from from my estimation, not been present in the German debate um, in the same way. Um, I think it is important to say that um, if the uh, if the economics ministry is looking after um, the interests of German commerce, for example, that is a German interest. It's a national interest. It could be also a national security interest in special in specific cases, right? Um, and so it's the it's this concept of defining um, that saying that Germany actually has a strong um, foreign policy and national security and military influence in Europe in the world together with nato with the eu with the united states um, g7 etc and to actually feel comfortable publicly stating what that is and i think that that's sort of that's that's part of the second end right um so i think you know i, I want to read this paper too um and um and i look forward to uh, to its follow-up excellent question for you peter um posed by dr ian anthony of cipri um, his question is, does the Secretariat at National Security Council, Secretariat or staff, bring scientific advice into the UK system in long range scoping and in pre pressing issues? Did the Secretariat have its own insights on COVID, for example? Well, it's a very good question. And just one sentence to add to what Julia said about national security strategies. I've now worked on a few in my time. I'm a bit suspicious that they are a useful guide to setting priorities in national security because governments tend to use them as opportunities to reassure the public that the whole range of national security issues are being well taken care of, everything's uh, under control and they needn't worry. And they tend not to be um, uh, instruments for prioritizing uh, scarce resources and applying them to the top priorities. So once you've got your national security strategy, in a way, at that point, that's when you need the National Security Council to translate that into operational priorities. Um, and I think the answer to, to uh, Ms. Anthony's question is no, I don't think it did have um, scientific um, knowledge plumbed into the national security structure, not when I was there. I think since the pandemic, everyone has realized that uh, public health um, uh, issues of technology are national security issues in their own right. And I'm sure that there is now more science and technology advice available to the National Security uh, Secretariat. Whether they've actually got a scientific advisor, I don't know. But I think looking back, it probably was a gap and that we were not paying sufficient attention to horizon scanning of the various scientific and technological risks to national security. I think probably that's now changed. I think you're muted, Boris. Now, here I am again. As a, as a comment on, on your observation on national security strategies, Peter, I'm sure you're, you're right. Um, I would just add the only thing that is worse than having a national security strategy is not having a national security strategy because you have nothing to work with, basically. So I, I think you have to go through that process. But I agree, we, you can come up with a marvelous paper if you don't have the mechanisms to turn it into something real. Um, it doesn't matter much. Yeah, um, I agree. Question um, from Christina Moritz, who is, uh, is uh, um, with the, the armed forces here in Germany um, and is somebody who's very interested in the issue of a national security council. She comments, 
the NSC need not be a stronger structure at all. In fact, if properly set up as a cabinet committee, it will strengthen existing government structures and procedures. And she was wondering whether that made sense to you, uh, Julia and Peter. I mean, I think in principle, yes. Um, you know, there's no, you know, the a lot of times what governments tend to do to solve a problem is create another body to uh, solve the magically solve the problem. Um, and so, you know, reinventing the wheel is not, you know, I, that's not something I, I agree with. I agree. Um, but I do think that there is more to be done for coordinating the ministries, particular at the mid level and junior level um, that ha I mean, it has to happen um, or else you have again, you have to send all of these really, really complicated, detailed issues way up to your bosses. And then that's what takes their time. Um, and if you can work it out at a lower level, you know, that that is more efficient for everyone. So again, I don't advocate for another mm. body. Um, don't want to scare my diplomatic friends mm. with that prospect, mm. but more coordination mm. internally, yes. I mean, I certainly agree that in the UK system, you could perfectly well call the National Security Council another cabinet committee. Um, it's got a few differences from our typical cabinet committees, particularly in the presence of a range of senior advisors, as well as ministers. So there's an official part of it and a, and a political part <clears throat> that meet and, and dovetail together. Um, also, I think it does depend crucially on how the leader wants to use the structure. If it's to be used for real decision making on major important issues, then it becomes a very powerful part of government and the most senior ministers will attend. If not, and if the prime minister or chancellor starts to skip meetings and delegate to other ministers to chair it and takes decisions elsewhere, very quickly, the National Security Council will um, dissipate uh, and dilute and ministers will send junior representatives and it will no longer be a powerful center of the government. So it's a very flexible structure. It depends entirely how the leader of the day wants to use it. And, and could I ask you, Peter, and then Julia to describe very briefly um, the process through which um, uh, issues are considered and uh, decision making prepared and, and brought up to the level of the, the principles? Well, in our, in our system, the National Security Advisor is a kind of honest broker between the Prime Minister and the various members of the committee. Um, I thought it was my function to try and give them a balanced diet um, so that there would be some foreign policy, some defense issues, some internal security, some short term crisis management, some longer term strategic thinking about our longer term priorities or future threats. Um, and I would assemble a weekly agenda for the meeting, which I would then get the prime minister to approve uh, and then it field complaints from other ministers when their subject wasn't on when they wanted it or when it was on and they didn't think it was relevant and act as a little bit of an honest broker to try and maintain, as I say, a varied diet of issues coming. The problem with all that is, as I said, that the urgent crisis issue always drives out um, the important but longer term issues and struggle as I could. I, I wasn't able to find a mechanism for that. Mm -hmm. But I think if, if the NSC is going to work properly, it needs to both obviously uh, reflect the direction of the political leader, but also interest the other ministers and make sure they feel they're getting their fair share of time and attention for what they think is important. There's also, Peter, if I remember correctly, at least there used to be something called NSIGs, National Security Implementation Group. So um, I imagine on an issue like Afghanistan, um, you would have a group of senior okay. officials who would um, get together and, and um, agree on some kind of uh, document that would be the basis of discussion and decision making. And from what I thought was interesting about the UK system was that um, the the chair in these groups um, over time could go from one uh, from an official in say the foreign office to an official in the MOD or some other agency it was not necessarily mm. set in stone and yeah. I think that's an interesting consideration because again um, in in the bureaucratic world of Germany where people are so concerned about winning or losing um, uh, chairing those meetings and preparing decisions to be taken at the level of principles is also an important role and something where 
these ministries um, can come into the picture and actually shape decision making. Is, yes. is that more or less how it works? Yeah, that is true. I mean, our model is loosely based on, on Julia's uh, US NSC. And so we did have an interagency, yes. And we did have a substructure of official level um, coordination meetings that didn't always have to be chaired by the cabinet office. And they tended to report to something I created, which we called the National Security Council Officials Group, the NSCO, which was the permanent secretaries in our system, the state secretaries in the German system. Um, of ministries represented on the NSC. So in our case, the senior civil servants, and that was a body which was supposed, first of all, to quality control uh, papers going into the NSC, but also to ensure follow-up uh, and that things happened as a result of the decision-making. And that created a new level in Whitehall for the state secretaries who didn't otherwise get together uh, in any collective forum like that, could also occasionally be used for longer-term strategic thinking as well. But yes, the idea of involving other ministries, giving them the chair sometimes if they were the leading advocate of a policy does help to create a little bit of buy in to this structure and avoid a feeling that it's a top down imposition on um, individual ministries. Julia? Sure. Um, you know, the U.S. system is, you know, run by political appointments, right? So even at the, you know, I mean, compared to European sy systems, the level that is brought in from the outside is surprisingly, you know, goes can go pretty far down. There are benefits to that, and there are because of the, you know, revolving door brings in out, outside expertise. There are also drawbacks because, um, uh, you know, experts don't always, you know, work their way up and you're always bringing in a boss up to speed. Um, I think, you know, and, and, and to go with that, the National Security Advisor is, a, is designed to be an honest broker, often an outside, outside personality, him or herself, right? And so that does sometimes create some, some tension sometimes. Um, I would say that there's often, you know, it, it can go, you know, the, the function can go bottom up or it could go top down, right? The priority could be set by uh, the cabinet and then task the interagency to start working it through. Um, and so then it goes back down to, um, to you know, sort of mid-level uh, mid uh, civil servants to start conversations and report back up to produce a report, to produce an analysis um, and have a meeting about it. Um, but what I think, you know, and that sort of, I think, logically makes sense for, for most systems. I think what is interesting about the American one is that it often goes bottom up, right? That, that like, you would identify a problem at a, you know, at the working level gather your colleagues on your own from your own initiative and say guys we need to start thinking about this something happens in the world let's start thinking about this um, a government changes in an important country let's have a, a foundational meeting about our priorities with that government um, and so though that i think was sort of that agenda setting was often uh, very useful the other thing that um that you can also do is be you know be a broad honest broker at a lower level so one one ministry is for you know department or agency in our terms is fighting with the, <laughs> fighting with each other and you sit and say okay we're going to have a meeting about this and we're going to figure it out um and i often did that right i would get a call from one part of the government saying you know we really want to prioritize this these other people aren't listening to us or they're on a different page can we have a meeting right so the state department would ask the nsc to have a meeting on an issue um and that um, allows for sort of more dynamic, uh, d dynamic policy making, or just at least level setting, mm -hmm. and just and to the point, you know, that on intelligence, there's always someone, even at the junior level, from uh, an intelligence agency who gives the the opening words. Right. This is what this this is what the situation is at the very beginning of the meeting. You open the meeting, you turn to the intelligence representative to to set set the scene. Right. And so there's this automatic incorporation of that analysis into what all of the departments and agencies around the table are responding to. And, and follow up question, Julia. So let's say you have this bottom, a bottom up kind of initiative. How do you get that on the agenda of the deputies committee or the principals committee at some point? Uh, well, once again, it's an art, right? So you could mention it in your briefings. Uh, you you pass it up in your you know in your written work. You mention it to the national security advisor. You mention it to your bosses, um, and you know. And so you could say we need to move this issue up to a different level, right? And you recommend that meeting to take place, and through a formal we have a sort of formal recommendation process for that meeting. Um, but a lot of times you're having. I mean, it's not 
I mean, I guess it would be sort of derogatory terms. You would say you have a meeting to have a meeting. But sometimes, you know, unless you do it too often, if, you know, and you really have no purpose for this, um, it really does end up sort of being the, the foundational work, uh, you know, and consensus building that is then in place when something happens, right? So I think that that's, and you might have a recurring monthly meeting on a specific high level issue. So when I was there, I started a process about, um, I'm, you know, precursor to the work I've done at the at the Atlanta Council right now in economic statecraft, right? How do we actually bring different agencies together around this growing, growing, growing emerging consensus that much of our national security is being projected through economic and financial means, right? So we would have a recurring meeting on that once a month um, to to see where everybody was. Thanks, Julia. Very helpful. Um, Peter, a question to you from one of our younger colleagues here at MSC, Martin Kahl, who says public debates on national security issues generally lag somewhat behind in Germany compared to the UK and the US. And question to you, has the public security debate in the UK benefited um, from the creation of a national security council and possibly from um, using a certain format, you now have the integrated review. Previously, you had national security strategies. Has that helped improve the debate? Um, not as much as I'd like. I think it's a really important question. I think the young generation uh, are going to inherit the world that national security councils are working on right now and deserve to have their word heard um, as, as we go through this enormous transformation. I don't think the creation of a National Security Council helps that very much. National security strategies certainly can, uh, and the integrated review that we did last year, which is a kind of national security strategy, um, the government did try to use that uh, to consult, to put out ideas, to encourage people to uh, feed in their own views and so on. I don't think it got a great deal of uh, uptake apart from the world of the think tanks and, and academia. And it is very difficult, given the <clears throat> complicated world we live in, to cut through with these sort of issues of national security and attract people's attention. Climate change is probably the one which really does get the young people's interest. Um, and there, I think the government can do a lot more to set out in approachable, accessible terms what the national security issues are and what's being done about it. So I think basically the national security strategy process, delivering it, drafting it, um, uh, producing it, conceiving it, um, and then implementing it ought to be a function where the public can be more involved and uh, we can encourage debate and, and discussion and ideas to be fed in. That's probably the most publicly accessible part of this national security process, I think. So let's let's stick with climate for a moment. In this this Zeitenwende report that we did in 2020, we had a paragraph on on climate, and essentially we said that the German government um, spends a lot of time worrying about climate issues, and lots of parts of the German government work on various aspects of the climate issue. But that we said that there's no serious interagency process to bring these things together. Um, and I think that was a fair statement. I mean, the Foreign Office had a, an annual report on climate and security issues, but it did not plug in with what the Ministry of Finance, Ministry of the Environment, Ministry of Economic Affairs, the Chancellor's Office was doing. That That's changed a little bit because under the new government, the Foreign Office has been put in charge of, um, of climate negotiations. So we now have have a bit of a link here between the national security setup and the climate environment setup. Um, but what, what are your thoughts, Peter and Julia, on, on climate and national security and, and how that is covered in your respective systems, if you can talk to that? Uh, I'm happy for Julia to go first, if you'd like to do that. I uh, I wish it were better than it is. I would say that we're still understanding climate as a national as it is again the way Americans would define a national security threat. Um, and so on some issues, like I mean, there are some of the most forefront issues facing um, facing our democracy is facing our our world um, on data and on climate. Um, we are far behind. 
um, we don't really have the structures in place to handle this. And I think that it, one of it is because of the separation of powers. Some of it has to, you know, a lot of it is about congressional powers and congressional appropriations. Um, and the other is about um, our federalized system, right? That a lot of climate policy ultimately in the United States is going to be devolved to the state level. Now, it may come from federal funding obligated by Congress, but it's going to be going to be handled um, by by local governments, but then also really by the private sector, right? Our data policy, and in many ways, our climate policy, um, whether it's you know it's big oil or it's you know our ever expanding, and I mean that ever expanding re renewable sector, are driven by private capital and by uh, providing incentives um, again at both the federal and municipal level for the expansion of that. Right. So again, this is where we're, we're a capitalist society. So I think that, the, and, and I think that there's um, this availability of capital drives the policy um, in the U.S. Not necessarily a bad thing, um, and it's a good thing. But I, but, um, but in ways that I think make it hard for us conceptually to say how are we going to sit down at the White House and and try to direct that. Mm. Well, I think Julia puts her finger on an important point that. There are so many different aspects of the climate crisis. There's the economic funding, there's the green finance initiatives, the kind of thing that the G7 summit uh, agreed last year. I think those will have been worked in Whitehall, not in the NSC structure, uh, but in a, uh, a coordination area uh, with our treasury, with our climate department, a bit more specifically. Then there's the whole area of national disaster preparedness. If we're going to have more uh, floods, um, extreme weather events of various kinds, then that whole uh, resilience planning aspect of the government, which in our system does come under the National Security Council, is called into play. Uh, and then there are the very, very difficult issues between uh, choosing between uh, lower energy prices uh, and less green investment or higher energy prices and investing for the long term uh, climate um, effect of you know, zero carbon targets and so on. That again is probably not handled in the national security structure. That's an issue of economic policy management and some very difficult choices. So it's an awkward issue that straddles partly the world of national security, but partly falls outside it. And I suspect in our government as well, apart from in preparing for the annual COP conferences, um, it's quite hard within government to pull all that together. You could, of course, lump it all into national security, expand the remit of the National Security Council, but there comes a point where the definition of national security is so wide that it's more or less the entire cabinet of the government uh, and there's not much point in having a separate national security council. So we tended as far as we could to keep economic policy issues uh, rather out of the national security apparatus, but that is not a perfect solution either. I have some good questions here. I'll, I'll take one from Stefan Steinecker, who was a staffer at the Bundestag previously with SWP, one of the, the leading German think tanks. And he has a very good question, which is, what added value can an NSC play in strategic communication? Um, and he asks whether there are any concrete examples from the US um, and or the UK where the NSC structure enabled a better framing and dissemination. I think that's a very good question, actually. Would, would one of you like to... Like to um, Respond, Julia, Peter. Well, let me let me say one thing. Um, I think strategic communication in conflict is a vital role for a National Security Council. Uh, I lived through the Libya experience, uh, where in the early stages we did a pretty bad job of strategic communication: what we were doing, why we were doing it, why we thought the risks were worth taking, uh, what the end game was, and so on. And we did pull together strategic communications operation within the NSC, which got out key messages uh, day by day, sometimes hour by hour, uh, and ensured that we didn't immediately lose the media battle because Sky News were reporting uh, what the Libyans claimed were uh, Western um, attacks on civilians and so on. There was a rebuttal function as well as a strategic messaging function. I think that works best in our system in uh, conflict. Uh, period. Outside conflict, it tends to be part of the wider government communication and uh, rebuttal operation, which goes well beyond national security. But at certain times, particularly when you cross that red line into conflict, 
then you need to be managing very actively and senior leaders want to be involved in strategic messaging about what you're doing. Julia? Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I think there's something to be said for, um, you know, a, a body that isn't a direct mouthpiece of the chancellor getting to speak on behalf of the federal government. So to say this is a consensus government opinion and therefore these are our talking points for the government itself, right? So obviously there's been a lot of communication, public communication, some things that some think it hasn't been enough from uh, from the German chancellor, some think it's better coming from some of the ministers have done a better job. But I think if you are, you know, if you are thinking of, you know, of, of beefing this up a little bit, being able to say to have someone who's not you know the the a the official uh, uh, official spokesperson of the chancellor, but of the uh, but of the German government itself could be helpful. I think again, also in times of um, in times of crisis, uh, particularly useful. Um, also, it just helps to make sure that if people aren't saying different things and contradicting each other, because that's what adversaries look to see, right? See where the weaknesses are between um, different factions of the government. I agree. And that's, of course, that's where the intelligence picture comes in as well. If you have a fast moving conflict and you have a bunch of ministers, um, you know, who are not even in the same room, I mean, possibly, you know, doing this via video and you're trying to get them on the same page, it requires them having a shared understanding of what the, what the situation is um, and then take it from there. I have another question here from um, a good friend of the Munich Security Conference. André Lösegrupp Pietri, who is the, the head of JEDI, um, the Joint European Disruption Initiative. Um, and he asks, which is a little bit in line with what was already asked, how do you include people um, from outside government, in particular regarding technology and science, um, into these things? So, you know, I, I guess you could also ask the question, are there people inside the government who are um, have expertise on emerging and disruptive technologies who are at the table and are part of the process. Um, and if you don't have that, how do you bring them in? Yeah, well, these are very good questions about how you involve wider opinion in some of the decision making that is needed in national security. I think we're long past the time when national security was a very secretive art that only happened behind closed doors with a few people involved in, in across governments. Nowadays, national security is a very public policy area, uh, and perhaps the pandemic um, and now the war in Ukraine just are double reminders of that. Disruptive um, policies and technologies are, I'm sure, part of the day-to-day -day work of um, a number of agencies in the government, um, not least those who are looking in the cyber area, for example, and those who are looking at the hybrid warfare uh, possibilities and how we protect against that. Uh, I think how you involve wider public debate, I think it's up to the government to try to make these issues important and interesting to people um, and then listen to their views. Um, it will never be um, a mass public uh, opinion consulting exercise. I don't think not enough people will be interested, but I do think it's time that, that this whole area of national security, including um, how we um, protect our societies against disruptive threats and risks and the divisiveness that uh, states like Russia and China um, uh, you know, always too happy to, to be working on. How we bring that is a discussion point um, in wider communities, scientific, technological, research communities, university communities, um, other citizens with an interest. We haven't done a very good job of that so far. We have tended to regard national security as a little bit of, you know, a, um, a private area that only a few specialists get involved with. I think the more use of, of national security strategy type documents, uh, laying out the issues for the public, encouraging them to engage with them and feed in their own views has got to be the way forward in the future. You know, I think in what's happening in Ukraine now has brought that home very, very strongly to a younger generation of people. Um, so let's try and capitalize on that and make sure that there is a wider public discussion of all these things. I think that's on that point, the integrated review was interesting in placing a lot of emphasis on science and technology and and the UK as a as a hub for science and technology. I think the the yes. the, the problem is also that um, both in the executive branch and in parliaments, we don't have a whole lot of people 
who are tech literate or you know in in a broader sense um, there's a there's a real dearth of people who understand these cutting edge issues which are which are changing the world so rapidly um, in part because the incentives perhaps aren't there for these you know um, talented people to go into government but um, Julia would you like to come in on that and then I'll go to Gerhard and I would like Gerhard also to speak briefly to we don't have much time the issue of cyber in our current setup, cybersecurity in the German setup, are we equipped to deal with those things? Julia. Sure, and um, if I minutes, I'll be quick then. I think there are a couple different ways that, um, that um, this expertise is brought into the current system. The White House does have an Office of Science and Technology that's specifically designed to bring in expertise and have an, a nexus for um, for the private sector um, and to understand how that it, you know how that intersects with national policy making. Um, you know, it does speak also to the revolving door to allow people to come in for short periods of time to take up political appointments who come from tech, um, who know how it functions. I mean, again, as a former regulator, my my big concern was. The government creates a lot of very cute policies but has no idea how they're actually implemented right so um the soldiers of our economic war uh, against russia are the companies not our armies right so that revolving door is is, is in incredibly important i think it's in select um circumstances and i think that there are appropriate firewalls to make sure that it's not this is not a, a lobbying exercise or a special interest exercise but to be able to brief um, uh, to brief the private sector, to get their input. Um, that was something that I was able to do much more efficiently at, um, at the White House under you know, strict observation of the press people um, uh, to be able to communicate that stuff then in the agencies where there is a lot more concern about fair and equal treatment. Gerhard. Yeah. Uh, very shortly, uh, but uh, disruptive technologies or cyber attacks uh, bring uh, to my notice uh, a framework which we developed in uh, Brussels uh, in form of the hybrid fusion cell. The hybrid fusion cell at INSEN uh, is a um, fuses inputs, not only intelligence inputs, but as well a high tech inputs from commission uh, directorates, for example, and of course from the member states. Uh, uh, not services only, but as well of the uh, Ministry of Technology and Research and so on and so forth, in order to, first of all, update, again, decision makers on uh, potential situational developments. Uh, that means, first of all, uh, if you want to prepare for eventualities and for risks and threats, first of all, you need to have this kind of scientific-based risk and threat awareness. Uh, and again, these have been papers, uh, comprehensive papers, but as well straight to the point, that means with potential action items, which had been prepared by the hybrid fusion cell uh, in Brussels to decision makers. And uh, that would, uh, again, uh, a dimension for a national security council. Again, uh, the substructure, yeah? first preparing awareness in order then to coordinate among, let's say, the government, uh, the different part of government. And just a last word on an ongoing cyber attack. Uh, if you uh, remember the prominent cases in the US as well, uh, when it comes to the colonial pipeline system, for example, uh, what was amazing in the end was uh, that uh, not even the Homeland Security uh, uh, and the Department of Justice were adequately uh, involved in government reaction. Uh, as, uh, let's say, was publicly uh, noted afterwards, uh, uh, they were not uh, being a part of the uh, information bubble. Uh, that, of course, uh, should be avoided. I don't know whether it's a question of the National Security Council at that time, uh, but, uh, the, uh, let's say, American friends officially publicly deplored this kind of silo mentality as well, still prevailing here and there in the, uh, uh, let's say, governmental structure. Why? I could imagine if this is true, I can only tell it from uh, reading uh, American newspapers, but uh, if you don't have a comprehensive body overseeing it, monitoring it, and taking care that everyone is at the, the right time at the right table. So again, it's another coordination function, at least when it comes to situation awareness, and especially when it comes to cyber attacks, you need this kind of very resilient, by the way, very fast uh, situation awareness uh, in order to enable everybody uh, to 
react as quickly as possible. I think this is perhaps an area where the UK has done quite well also with the National Cyber Security Center, where it has a setup that actually brings all the key government actors, at least, to the table. We're, we're basically out of time, but I want to ask a quick question to Peter and Julia, and, and that is on accountability. In my mind, uh, one important reason for having a National Security Council set up and more of a structure is accountability. So to, to create an element of transparency, at least within the executive branch, on uh, who knows what, who's in charge, and who was part of the decision making. Um, does that sound right to you, Peter? Yes, and I think I said at the beginning that was part of the motivation for having a National Security Council, a sense that decision making under Tony Blair over the Iraq war was not as transparent or as rigorous and formal as it should have been. Whether that's right or wrong, that was the perception. And so the idea of the National Security Council would be a place where clear decisions are taken in the presence of the government's legal advisers, carefully minuted for the record, uh, and then the Prime Minister is accountable to Parliament for decisions taken. That is certainly part of the rationale for having the NSC. Yep. And thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to participate in this. Thank you very much, Peter. Julia. I agree with that. I mean, there's always going to be the the shadow meeting to the shadow meeting that just happened. Um, that's just the reality of how of who meets in the hallways. Um, so that's uh, so that there's no accountability for those things with no paper trail. But I think that you know, as a structure, it is very important. Someone has to hold the bag, and if the entire government holds the bag in some way, um, it is um, it's a little it's a more of a responsible approach. But um, again, thank you uh, for the invitation. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you, Julia, and and um, also many thanks to Gerhard for for being part of this. Um, I really enjoyed the conversation. Um, I hope our viewers got something out of it. I hope the YouTube experience um, was a reasonable one. Um, many thanks to our viewers for um, some very good questions. We don't know whether this government coalition will actually move towards creating uh, more of a structure um, and using the Federal Security Council or creating a new National Security Council. Um, but I think um, what you provided is some food for thought that um, I think will be will be um, will be taken note of that that people will pay attention to. So many thanks to you all. Um, many thanks to our team at, at MSC for setting this up. Um, and um, we we um, we hope to be in touch and we'll keep you updated on these on these things. Thank you so much. And good night.